Heading into Survivor Series, one of my big questions, why does this show need to be four hours? And if you're going to do this with these big four pay-per-views, you either need to have more matches or you do need to cut back the non-mania big fours to three hours because we don't need several stupid backstage segments with Stephanie McMahon and we don't need endless video packages and crappy commercials to fill that four hours of time. But ultimately, Survivor Series. Heading into this show, it's Raw versus SmackDown. Like I was talking about in the preview video, it felt more like a one-night-only bragging rights type of show. We've got Raw going against SmackDown, but there's really nothing at stake. There's really, truly nothing on the line. No, like, future draft picks in uh, a future WWE draft, uh, the 30th spot in the Rumble for the Raw or SmackDown brand, nothing of any significance was at stake. Or saying, you know, the the winner of the night gets their title match as the main event of WrestleMania. All of these things that you could have put in there as logical points to say, hey, maybe people will give a crap, you just didn't have. It was just really weird that the whole premise of this was trying to build this up like it was something important. And there was really fundamentally nothing except bragging rights at stake. So you kind of had to go into this show with lowered expectations naturally, skillfully done by WWE, because there's not a lot of story there. There's not a lot to think of in terms of where we're going to go going forward. This really was kind of mostly, with a couple of exceptions, just a night that was kind of isolated in and of itself. And how did the WWE do with this format, with this concept, eh, kind of depends. I was surprised from the beginning of the main show with the Shield and New Day match kicking it off. You're telling me the guy that you're going to have main event WrestleMania in a few months that you're going to spend a lot of time building that show around is in the curtain jerker spot here at Survivor Series. It was just weird and strange to me. That said, it ended up being, I feel like, a good choice for the opener because it set a good tone for the night. I enjoyed the match quite a bit for what it was known as kind of one of these one-off special attraction type of things. I was fine with the match. You know going into it that the Shield won, but they still did a good job of getting to where they were ultimately getting. They did some cool stuff. This is one of these ones where I could just kind of sit back, shut up, and enjoy it because there wasn't going to be a whole lot for me to complain about. Unlike the next match. Oh my god. This five-on-five -five women's tag match. Five letters together... Perfectly describe it. The acronym. FUBAR. FUBAR! Fucked up beyond all recognition. Just so many things about this match were so fundamentally FUBARD. The team captain that you eliminate first, in short order, very unceremoniously, is not Alicia Fox, it's Becky Lynch. Strange and puzzling and an indication of the crap that was to come. We have Bailey look like a freaking monster early just for Tamina to then unceremoniously eliminate her. To which we were building that up so that way we could have Nia Jax and Tamina do some family crap in the middle of the ring. And honestly, the Houston crowd didn't really care. And most of us probably didn't really care. It just did this so that way they could get to the point where Nia Jax was going to be a victim of the chicken shit countout. Let's not build her up into being a real monster or anything. And we can't do anything to actually have her beat, so let's just have her counted out early and get her the hell out of there. Later on, you get Naomi and Alicia Fox. This was terrible. Alicia sitting there running towards the ropes, and then she doesn't go into the ropes. Everything about this was bad. And then when you get to the actual pinfall finish, did Alicia actually get eliminated? It's like one of these things she kicked out, but was she supposed to kick out? Was she not? Did the rest screw it up? Did she screw it up? I don't know. But at this point in time, Naomi and Alicia were so bad in their little spot, I would have eliminated both of them because they suck so bad. And then we get down to kind of nut-cutting time once we get past Sasha Banks and all her stupid crap. We have Asuka with two people left on the SmackDown team to where she ultimately gets Natalia in a knee bar when it's between the two of them, where Natalia immediately pops up and forgets to sell the knee bar and is sitting there twirling around and doing all types of crap. And just what this ultimately led to was a finish where the right person won in Asuka 
but it got her absolutely zero momentum in my opinion. It wasn't like this huge awesome thing like, oh my god, Asuka was awesome, Asuka was incredible, Asuka was dominant. It was none of that. It was the people kind of pop because they kind of like Asuka, they kind of pop because she won, and that was really it. I was expecting this to go in one direction, because it seemed like it set up for one direction. And they kind of went in that direction, but in a totally WWE foobard way. This match was terrible. One of the worst matches I have seen out of this company in 2017. The Miz versus Baron Corbin, your battle of mid-card champions, IC versus US champion. Not one of those things that on the surface sets the world on fire. It really isn't. Not something that's going to get you very excited. Because you feel like the Miz is here and Baron Corbin is way down here. That said, the match itself was a little bit of a surprise in that it was much better than I thought it probably had any business being. This is one of Baron Corbin's better matches. Not that they're saying a whole lot, but we will take the positive of it was one of his better matches. It still ultimately was just kind of one of those matches that was there. Didn't really feel like it belonged on a pay-per-view. If you would have told me, speaking of stakes for matches, that... Future child support payments to Maurice were on the line here. Then, oh baby, these two guys got something incredible to fight over. But instead, it wasn't. Corbin probably needed the win. The Miz, to me, should have won, but that's just my Miz bias. But Baron Corbin needed this, and it was a decent night for him. The Bar versus the Usos is probably the match that I would have kicked off the main card to Survivor Series with. But that said, not really anything for me to complain about. Because it ended up kind of being situated well right here in the middle of the card. Because at this point in time in the show, I'm still trying to recover for the horrendousness of that women's traditional Survivor Series 5-on-5 tag match. It was that bad, folks. It was that bad. And the bar versus the Usos kind of cleansed the palate a little bit. Kind of reset the night. And it was a very good match. I have to say... I was down on the Usos being heels, I didn't like the shtick, I didn't think it would work, and I was completely and totally wrong, and I think Cesaro and Sheamus have become a very good tag team in their own right. You've got two pretty good tag teams, two tag teams that could do good tag team stuff. This was a very good, exciting tag team match, which was interesting, because you didn't necessarily have a team that the crowd could kind of universally get behind, you're kind of splitting the crowd, but I still felt like it really worked. This match was one of the highlights of the night. If you're part of that crowd that believes that someday women should main event WrestleMania, and I'm not saying I'm totally opposed to that idea, this probably wasn't your best night to point to and make that as a solid, strong argument. This wasn't a great night for the women in WWE in terms of the performances. I look at this women's champion versus women's champion match. I appreciate very much Alexa Bliss trying to be a character in her matches, trying to stay true to her character, actually emphasizing things like facials and not getting the hell beat out of her and smiling like some of the other women on the roster do, actually bothering to try and tell a story based off of her character, based off of the match. It's just at times I don't know if it fully compensates for what appears to be a complete lack of in-ring skill and just overall being sloppy and botchy. And then you throw Charlotte in the mix, who is sloppy and botchy herself. It's just, it's not a recipe for success with this women's match. And it wasn't. This was not a fun match to sit through. This was not a good match at all. And it's weird because it seemed like to me, if you were ever going to have a cash-in, this would have been the perfect night, the perfect moment, the perfect opportunity to have Carmella cash in. That way, neither one of these ladies has to put the other person over. You don't make either women's champ look weaker just weird that they didn't go there. I will say the right person won because it works more having Alexa lose than having Charlotte lose, who just literally won the belt this past Tuesday. But this match was a complete and total dud that couldn't get over soon enough to me. I think the match that the most people were the most excited about on this card was Universal Champion versus WWE Champion, Brock Lesnar versus AJ Styles. And I think with that change of title from gender to AJ, it ramped up the excitement level for a lot of fans heading into this show. And I kind of understand it in the sense of WWE kind of put themselves into a box where if you did go with Brock Lesnar and Jinder Mahal, are you really going to have Brock Lesnar work a competitive match with Jinder? Furthermore, if you weren't going to do that, if you're going to have a dominant 
Lesnar one-sided affair, then how stupid do you make Jinder look as your WWE champion with no real natural out in terms of somebody interfering or somebody shaking things up? So from a logic and booking and etc. standpoint, Brock AJ does make more sense. The problem with this match to me first and foremost was because of the format of the show and how things have played out. And at this point in time, it's three to two SmackDown's up. You know heading into it that no matter what happens, Lesnar is winning. And I don't care how hard the guys work, no matter how hard the guys try, it's a fundamental problem with the format of this type of show, how the WWE always likes to do this, where it's kind of, you get a little bit, then you give a little bit, and then it stays even the rest of the way, is that you already know what's going to happen one way or another. Either there's going to be interference or Brock's winning clean. It takes a lot of the suspense and spontaneity out of the match because you're just waiting for it to get over. And what I don't understand is why Jinder wouldn't just interfere and cost AJ the match if he was so pissed off about it and he wanted to get the championship back. You could say, well, he wants to let Lesnar beat the hell out of AJ. Well, that still could have happened, and then Jinder still could have sent a message from a character standpoint. So it's just kind of weird how they didn't have him get involved here. Um, in terms of the match and way it was laid out, Brock had moments that he looked great and he dominated. AJ got some shine and some moments where he looked phenomenal. It was probably about the match you could expect these two to have, the type of match that you would want these two to have. That said, to me it was a little too short for it to make a major impact. It really wasn't the fantastic piece of work that I saw a lot of people talking about afterwards. And to me, this is an example of allowing biases and giggly titsness about Lesnar versus AJ, AJ Styles clouding your better judgment. When you watch that match, it was not a phenomenal match. It was an average to above average champion versus champion match. It had some special attraction appeal, but again, with the format of the show, you already knew who was going to win ahead of time, and I don't think it was that spectacular to overcome the fact, like, we didn't get enough of it. Just as maybe it was really starting to get good, it was over. And I find it very interesting now, the WWE, we're seeing through the tricks. They're sitting there and having Brock beat everybody with one F5. So that way, come WrestleMania, when Roman kicks out of like three of them, it's going to be a big freaking deal. How silly of me, knowing who was in this five-on-five -five men's traditional Survivor Series tag match, how foolish and shameful of me to not be able to foresee that this match was clearly going to main event Survivor Series. Like, how could it not? You didn't have much of a choice here. I mean, for Christ's sake, they had John Cena, Randy Orton, and the King of Kings, the game, the cerebral assassin, God Ugger. Of course this match was going to main event. Are you kidding me? And when you got to the match itself, after about 20 minutes of entrances and how glorious it was, that's how we fill time, with multiple Stephanie segments backstage and incredibly long promo or intros. You're trying to tease all these dream matches, which is cool. It's part of the appeal of doing a five-on-five -five tag match like this. You're trying to sell it like everything's at stake, but you're also trying to plant seeds for the future and see how the crowd responds, and da 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 and that's cool. What I also thought was cool is how when you're at the Breakfast Club, you have the option to wear your own shirt. Everybody else on Team Raw is wearing the Raw shirt. God doesn't play those games, ever. And then you look at <laughs> Team Blue... You're all blue, except Cena, because he's got green merch to sell. That's Breakfast Club, baby. That's what you do when you've got that type of power and political presence. Although what was really weird as the match went along, to see Cena just kind of unceremoniously pinned by the 48-year-old Hall of Fame Raw general manager. That was strange. That was really, really odd. That it was just like, you hit an angle slam, and you hit another angle slam, and then this bitch is over and Cena rolls out and like it was no real consequence that he was there to begin with. Then you've got Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn coming in and interfere, which I think a lot of us foresaw happening. And after they get a little bit of in and they get some good clean shots in, they are ultimately chased off by the 47-year-old SmackDown general manager with one chair. These two grown-ass men who just attacked the general manager who is 47 years old, Shane McMahon, they just got ran off and ran backstage by this same dude, the 47-year-old SmackDown general manager and part-time in-ring competitor with a steel chair.
And I'm okay with that because it makes them look stupid because, frankly to me, they are stupid. But nonetheless, you get down to nut-cutting time. And the way this whole match is structured and played out, it was just really, really strange because ultimately, you've got, again... The sole survivor at this point for the SmackDown team was the 47-year-old general manager of SmackDown named Shane McMahon who had to deal with three guys, two of them being 48-year-olds in Kurt Angle and Triple H, and the other guy being Braun freaking Strowman. And at this point in time, you don't know what the hell is going to happen, but you already kind of feel like you know what the end result is going to be. But we kind of did, but we kind of didn't. Because this whole show, this whole night, was about one thing and one thing above all else, and that was Breakfast Club business, bitches. Oh, the glory and the majesty and the sheer divinity that we were all blessed to witness on Sunday night in this Survivor Series main event. When you want to talk about Breakfast Club business, it doesn't get any more Breakfast Club than this, baby. The fact that it is 2017... 2017, a big four pay-per-view, and the main event is still partially revolving around John Cena, Randy Orton, and Triple H is just majestic. What more can you say? No hate needed. See the door if you've got any. You blasphemers. You heretics. Satan worshippers. And, and there's surely a lot of you that sit there and foolishly pray and believe in, pray to, believe in, some invisible man in the sky who's going to take all your pains away, who allows millions upon millions of children in the world to grow up in abject squalor, poverty, starve to death, a world where we have millions of kids afflicted with cancer every year, and they die because of that. You have all these animals that are abused and tortured and killed off by man because man is fundamentally evil but allow somebody like Charles Manson to live to the age of 83. That's the God that you foolishly worship and believe in. Somebody you can't even see. That clearly, if you look at it from an objective viewpoint, you would question the legitimacy of that individual. And you would question just how good they were at their job. Whereas I can turn on WWE at this time of year. And I can see God at work. I can see Him. I can see the divine. I can see the miracles that he can make happen. That is God, people. You can see it. You can hear it. You can believe in it because it's real. And you saw it all again this Sunday night at Survivor Series. Look at what God was able to pull off. Just look at it. Not to mention the fact he's on Team Raw, but he's wearing his own shirt. He went into business for himself. That's what the Breakfast Club does, bitches. And all these years later, it clearly has worked for him. But think about it. He replaces Jason Jordan in this 5-on-5 tag match. Sets up potentially a future match for him. He gets involved when it's down to 3-on-1, where Kurt Angle is beating on Shane. So he ultimately takes out Kurt Angle, then puts Shane over him, so Shane can pin Kurt Angle 1-2-3, so that way now Triple H and Kurt Angle have real heat, setting up a future match down the road. Who knows where? Maybe at WrestleMania? Think about this, the miracle that this man can make happen, that all these years later, when we get to this time of year, one of the number one priorities for this company, if not the single number one priority for this company, is making sure that God gets his WrestleMania match. Glorious my ass. Oh, Bobby Roode and Triple H had a showdown. One is God. The other one is a pretender. And we all know the pretender is not God, because he is God. He is God. God, God, God. And I hope you all get that and understand that based off of the expert political power play that we saw at play here. Your 48-year-old COO of the company is setting up future matches with Jason Jordan, future matches with Kurt Angle. Then he, of course, ultimately pedigrees Shane because we're not going to allow Braun Strowman to get this highlight. We're not allowing him to get this shine, to get this moment because this is about breakfast club and family business, bitch. And Triple H is going to hit the pedigree on Shane McMahon and Triple H is going to get the victory. Praise God. Ugh. So setting up a future match between him and Shane McMahon, potentially at a WrestleMania, potentially not. So thinking about that, even at this point in time, this man 
This God amongst mere mortals has set up three future potential marquee matches for himself. And even if you knock out Jason Jordan from that equation, you still have future matches with Shane McMahon and Kurt Angle. That's a big deal. And then afterwards, when you get the Braun Strowman involvement, and Braun Strowman takes out God, which only happened because God allowed it to happen, he is a fair and merciful God after all. He is also smart enough to recognize where the money player is. So Triple H being Triple H, being God of WWE, knows he needs to latch onto that and try to make some money off of that. So when Braun Strowman wipes him out, that sets up, wouldn't you know it, a future potential match between the two of them, maybe even at WrestleMania. So at this point in time, Triple H has three different options for his WrestleMania match this year. He's potentially set up future other big four matches down the road, Probably gives him an excuse to be in the Royal Rumble match. At this point in time, how could you doubt this man's divinity? How could you be a non-believer? How could you be a blasphemer? How could you be a heretic? You have seen God's work. You have seen the miracles he has bestowed, most importantly, because he is the Breakfast Club upon himself. Because that is what matters most in the Breakfast Club. It is not we, we, we. It is me, 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 me. And nobody, but nobody, is better at the me game than the game mug. You've seen the miracles and how majestic it was. And for those of you that foolishly, naively, will buy into the Triple H was so messed up, that he walked into the thing going backstage after the show went off the air. I've seen it, it's on the internet, so it must be true. Understand this. After what you saw on this night, in this main event, you dare to doubt God? You know he is who I've said he is. I am your prophet of the YWC for a reason, because I have tried to spread the word of God. And I hope now, finally, you all see this. It's not about the future. It's not about anything else other than God and his WrestleMania match. He knew that was there. He created it. He made it. He put it there. He walked into that for the entertainment of the people, baby. Ugh. And how foolish of anybody to not be able to see that. So what did I ultimately think about Survivor Series? You know, I was kind of going through the motions with the show. Shield New Day is good. Bar Usos is good. Some other matches, eh, not so much. Five on five women's tag match, piece of crap. Fubard beyond all recognition. Totally Fubard. Brock and AJ was kind of a mild disappointment. Not terrible, but not what it needed to be. But ultimately, it doesn't matter who gives a shit after the glorious, divine finish that I got out of this show, 100% in A+, plus, baby. Most importantly of all, because again, in a world where it's not about we, 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 but me, 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 it is now given me. It is now given me several months of material heading into WrestleMania 34. Ugga. That's how I choose to play the game of. While a lot of you probably won't love this Survivor Series show, the way it finished with the only thing that mattered, I thought it was a miracle. And it was a miracle brought to us all by the God we can see, not the one we can't. And that's the God I choose to believe in.